invite you to turn to Psalm 72, Psalm 72. When Devin uh, invited me to speak, I was thrilled. I w- always love coming back to Highway. It was one of the best years of our lives when we were members here, but Rosebud called and if they let me preach, I'm going to preach. So we've enjoyed our ministry at Rosebud, but we're certainly blessed with the year that we were members at Highway as well. Well, when Deb invited me to speak, glad to come back to Highway, and also glad when he said, just preach something on your heart, just some message you've preached that you think would be a benefit to the brothers and sisters at Highway. I was thrilled about that till I began to think and select and work, and I realized, whoa, what if I pick a text or a theme that has been addressed a half a dozen times this summer already? Or worse, what if I pick a text that Devin spoke on Sunday, because his would probably be a better sermon than mine. So I'm hoping Psalm 72 uh, will be a benefit uh, to us in terms of a psalm and a theme perhaps not heard for a while. So hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice lest the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth, In his days, may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. May he have dominion from the sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him as enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render them tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all the kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May the gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. May there be abundance of grain in the land, on the tops of the mountains may it wave, may its fruit be like Lebanon, and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever, his fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him, all nations call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be the glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with His glory. Amen and amen. This is the word of the Lord. And this word just flat disturbs me. Because if I take its message seriously, I'll have to change some deeply rooted attitudes and actions that feel as comfortable as a pair of well-worn jeans. I'll have to confront realities I'd rather ignore. Its message unravels my neatly packaged understanding of life and ministry that has been nurtured in the well-to-do suburban settings of my birth and my upbringing among the haves. This psalm, however, is a call to action on the behalf of the have-nots who suffer injustice, poverty, affliction, and oppression, the powerless, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, not the kind of people that I'm with a lot, quite frankly. I'd rather ignore them and ignore their problems. I'd rather pretend their plight can't be nearly as bad as it seems to be or that, well, they only have themselves to blame. I'd rather drive around their neighborhoods, some of which are only a few blocks away from my Harding office. My life is less complicated if I ignore them, their problems, and their neighborhoods. If I just turn my eyes the other way, I can go my merry way. Lord knows, I have enough problems of my own, and I have enough to worry about without adding another burden to bear another reason to feel guilty 
or another responsibility to fulfill. So this psalm disturbs me, really disturbs me. It disturbs me, it shakes me as I was shaken when I first went to India way back in 1985. It was my first trip outside the United States, my first transatlantic flight, my first short-term mission trip, my first cross-cultural experience. And soon after landing in Bombay, now Mumbai, I thought, what in the world was I thinking? Because within a few hours of arrival, I was ready to take the next flight home, to run away like Jonah, <laughs> to my comfortable, secure, suburban, fairy tale existence. I remember thinking, how will I ever survive six weeks of this? The sights, the smells, the smells overwhelmed me. Even before I left the airport terminal, I was surrounded by hundreds of children, arms outstretched, eyes pleading, begging for help. I had been warned, even by long-term missionaries in India, that the majority of child beggars were pawns in an elaborate begging scam and that giving them money was probably going to do more harm than good. So resist, resist, resist. I followed the advice of the seasoned missionaries and others, but my emotions were already at a breaking point before I left the terminal and got in the taxi. Now, I don't know about the beggars at the airport, but I know this for sure. In the 30-minute trip from the airport to my hotel, I saw more poverty, homelessness, and helplessness than I'd seen in a lifetime. My eyes glued to the window of the taxi. I realized that I'd landed in a world I had never known, a world that I didn't even know existed, a world I thought I can escape and go back home if I can just last six weeks but a world I realized that was not only their present reality, but their future reality and their only reality they would ever know. There is one image that's etched in my mind and heart, and it's glued there to this day. It disturbs me still to this day. There was a little boy, about the age of my daughter back in Virginia at the time, who was wading waist deep in an open sewer. And he was bending down, just barely keeping his head and chin and mouth out of the water while he pawed around for some little trinket or perhaps the gold of a few coins. There was no begging scam here. This was actual, unimaginable misery. What if that were my child? What if that were your child? Well, by the grace and power of God, I did survive my six weeks in Mumbai. I enjoyed the India off the tourist track, far from five-star hotels and luxury dining. I experienced the India of actual human need and desperation. And strangely, strangely, I was changed and fell in love with a country and a culture and a people to which I returned again and again and again over the years. Most recently in the summer of 2004 when I accompanied 12 Harding mission interns to India and Highway's own Scott Adair was a part of that trip also. I realized so much had changed since 1985. Silicon Valley, India style, now dotted the landscape, evidence of India's rise to one of the greatest economic powers in the world today. BMWs, Mercedes, Lexus automobiles competed with the ever-present Indian-made ambassadors for maneuvering room on crowded highways. Everyone had a cell phone. Fine restaurants, high-rise luxury apartments, Sunday afternoons at the beach, planned vacations to Europe and America, all signs that a prosperous middle class was arising in India. Nothing like I had seen in 85. So much had changed, but so much had changed the same, stayed the same. In the midst of economic prosperity, there remained huge islands of abject poverty. 
the Harding students and I spent one whole day strolling through the streets of the biggest slum in Mumbai. In fact, advertised as the biggest slum in all of Asia. Cardboard boxes upon cardboard box houses stacked two, three, four stories high. Open sewers snaking through the densely packed cardboard houses with tin roofs. We walk slowly and silently. This is no place for frivolous talk. This is no place for humor. This is no place for laughter. The reality is too overwhelming. And so we walk silently. No pictures allowed. These are people's homes. This is not for the stuff of a mission report when you get back home. Not embarrassing them with pictures. No running water, no electricity, no indoor toilets, no garbage collection, no clothes except the clothes on their backs, no money, no education, no future, no hope. So as you can imagine, no flat screen TVs or computers or video games or name brand fashions or cars or pickups or four wheelers or bass boats. <laughs> For these people in this slum, no cell phones at all. And from almost all of them, no knowledge of Jesus Christ. As I saw the Harding students seeing what I first saw nearly 20 years early, earlier, I suspected they were feeling what I felt then. They were overwhelmed. They were speechless with a sea of poverty and helplessness and hopelessness that engulfs you and drowns you. But then potentially, potentially, can resurrect you to a new reality. So what do you do when you experience something so overwhelming? Well, you can run away, and I felt like it. You can try to deny the undeniable reality. You can say it must be their fault, and they can find their way out. You can sit down and have a good cry, which is not such a bad thing when all of your senses are on overload. Maybe you can consider the disturbing message of Psalm 72 and find a calling for your life. And maybe the church can find a calling for its life in this psalm. Psalm 72 is a psalm for the king of Israel. The psalmist invites God to enact his own righteousness and his own justice through the reign of a newly anointed king of David. This prayer poem was probably written at the inauguration for a new king. And king after king, it had been read over them and sung over them. Hope permeates the psalm. Hope that this king will extend the righteousness and justice of God to God's people and to the world. Hope that this king of Israel will rule with the heart of the king of heaven and earth. Notice, for example, the fourfold occurrence of Ur in verses 1 and 2. Here's the prayer for the king. Endow the king with your justice, O God. The royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people. May your afflicted ones receive justice. Surely we caught that. <laughs> All the people are God's people. Yes, the king on the throne, but also the afflicted and the oppressed and the poor and the needy. These are God's people too. And the king, though he's invested with kingly power, almost absolute power in Israel, this king needs to be God's man also. And if he's God's king, he will make sure God's people receive God's justice and God's righteousness. So dispensing God's justice and righteousness was the first responsibility of the king of Israel. Greater than his responsibility to the government, to the military, to the economy. Justice and righteousness formed the foundation upon which all of these other possibilities flowed. God's king is not simply a skilled diplomat, an effective administrator, an astute politician, or fearless military leader, though he may have been all of those things. At heart, he is the one whose judgments are just and righteous for all people. 
So verses 12 through 14 express his calling. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. So the king of Israel's reign is an extension of the very reign of God. The king's heart is an expression of the very heart of God. Power resides in the king's position. The psalmist hopes, the psalmist hopes that the king will use this unbelievable power to make the kingdom of God a reality in the lives of God's people. That a kingdom of justice and righteousness, prosperity, fertility, peace, well-being, harmony, what the Hebrews called shalom, would be established through the reign of the king. Power and responsibility power and possibility. However, for every Davidic king for whom this prayer was offered, for whom this psalm was sung, the chasm between power and possibility, between calling and capacity, was as wide and deep as the Grand Canyon. No king, not even the best of the kings, fulfilled the promises and possibilities that Psalm 72 imagined. No Davidic king did so until Jesus, Davidic king, returned to Nazareth where he had grown up. And on the synagogue he went to church as was his custom. And the scroll of Isaiah 61 was handed in him and he unrolled it and found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. This is kingship language. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, the hope of Psalm 72 was also the hope of the prophets. And on that day, Jesus said, Psalm 72, the hope of the prophets is fulfilled in your hearing, fulfilled in my ministry. In his life, the reign of God came down upon earth through His teaching and deeds and miracles and words, through His suffering, His giving, His sacrificing, through His obedience to the will of the Father, the kingdom of God began to reign on earth as it was reigning in heaven. Jesus, heir of the throne of David, for the first time among all the kings of David, actually fulfilled perfectly Psalm 72 now that's good news but the hard gospel is how do I translate that into my life what does it mean for me and what does it mean for you and what does it mean for this church and Rosebud and God's people wherever they meet. This is the hard gospel. So now we've got to translate the message of Psalm 72. Indeed, we have to translate the very life of Jesus Christ into our lives and into our ministry. That is hard gospel. I, I don't even know where to start. His purpose is through us become realized in this world. And, and what a world it is. 60% of the world's population lives in Asia, 13% in Africa, 12% in Europe, 8% in North America, 6% in South America. There is this reminder that there is a world of need beyond Circe and Judsonia. There is a world of need. That many more people speak Mandarin and Hindi then speak English and Spanish. That 800 languages spoken by 800 million people in the world have no Bible in their own language. 
that 40%, 40% of the world's population lives on less than $300 a year. And 80% of the world's diseases comes from contaminated water. 70% of the world's rural population does not have access to clean, treated water. 14 million children ages birth to five die every year from diarrhea, infectious disease, and respiratory disease. 14 million children per year, 270,000 a week, 38,000 a day, 1,500 in every 83 per hour, one every two seconds, dies of diseases that are easily treated. How many have died since I began? Well, the feelings that flooded me back in 1985 were not unique to me. In Christianity Today, there was a reflection written by 18-year-old Debbie Shepherdson. Don't know her, but was impacted by the poem she wrote. She also went to India, and in tears on a street in Calcutta, she wrote this. Why is it, Lord, that I don't feel... I've seen the wounds that only you can heal and poverty that no one should bear, yet it's hard for me to care. I, I want to care, I want to love, but instead I push and shove. I, I, I don't want to look into their hungry eyes or brush away the many flies. Instead I want to look the other way and wish I didn't have to stay. A wall goes up and I'm not there. But God, but God... I really want to care. The Lord, know, knowing my heart, I hope, believes that I, I feel, really want to care. We just don't always know how. And I believe that the vast majority of God's people really want to care. They're just not always sure how to go about it. And most churches, once they realize the joy of reaching out and helping and, and serving those who really need serving, realize this is what church is all about. So exciting. I have the privilege of teaching and interacting with students, many of whom, not all, not all, but many of whom really want to care. In a few short years from the time they sit in my freshman Bible class, they will finish their work at Harding and move on. And I think of the influence that so many are already exerting as Christian missionaries and ministers. Right now, God has prepared and is preparing these students to plant outposts to the kingdom of God in Asia and Africa and Eastern Europe, Latin America, but also the inner city of L.A. and Chicago and Dallas and D.C. The calling that impresses on their hearts encourages me and challenges me. But the fact is, most are not called to be missionaries and ministers. Nevertheless, I think of the influence they're going to possess as Christian educators whose passion for learning will catch fire in the heart of their students. Or the Christian attorney and judges who will strive to enact righteous judgments, equitable judgments for rich and poor, red and yellow, black and white or Christian physicians and nurses and PAs and PTs who may give two or three or more weeks every year of their lives in medical missions or maybe operate as do some do now a free medical clinic at River City Ministry in Little Rock. Or Christian CEOs of major corporations who will decide to turn back some of the company's profits to the local community or Christian artists, musicians, playwrights, film producers, Christian athletes who will use their platform for the gospel and for good. I hesitate on the next one. Or Christian politicians. Parentheses, is that an oxymoron? <laughs> I hope not. Or Christian politicians whose Christian faith is more than a ploy to get votes, but is the nerve that moves their muscles to action 
in their spheres of influence. The power of position or office, the power of influencing the influential, the power of money, but most of all, the power of personal integrity, power of Christian character, power of a Christian life lived well. I see that in the eyes and lives of these 18-year-olds who will be sitting in my freshman class this semester. And it's going to be so fun watching them track those four years and talking with them in my office about the plans and dreams that sometimes seem so crazy. You just, you just shake your head and say, oh, to be young and dumb again. A young man a few years ago sat in my office and said, Dr. T, the Lord has laid it on my heart to be a missionary in Afghanistan. First question, have you told your mom and dad about this? Well, yes, I have. And they support what I'm proposing. I thought he was crazy. I didn't, I didn't tell him that. I'm just thinking it. I said, well, let's, let's talk. Let's talk. Well, it's very clear he had thought it through. I'm purposely choosing not to get married, though I've had opportunities, because there's no way I could fairly expose a wife and children to the dangerous call that I think the Lord has placed on my heart. And for 30 or more minutes, he, he went on and on convincing me that he felt strongly this was God's call, and woe be to me to try to talk him out of it. For years, I didn't even mention the country, but he's now safely back in the States for a number of years he worked clandestinely in Afghanistan bringing people to Jesus and he did all of that are in the hands of my students but it's not just in their hands it's in my hands it's in your hands it's in the hands of the highway church I don't know all that is it jumpstart? Uh, I don't know what all that is about, but I have the impression it's in line with the kind of things the church might do in keeping with Psalm 72. So if so, I commend you again. It's in my hand and yours. Over 40 years of preaching ministry, I've seen the church at its worst, but also its best. I've seen the church turn inward, but also outward. I've seen the church focused on self, but also focused on others. I've seen the church just keeping house, just trying to keep the doors open. And I've seen the church launched on a mission that not Satan or hell is going to stop. And I've seen the church acting nothing like Jesus. And I've seen the church acting very much like the Savior. I've seen the church dishonor God by its infighting and its jealousy and its envy. But I've also seen the church bringing glory to God by its faithfulness and its mission. Now which will it be for Highway? For Rosebud? With whatever power and influence an opportunity. God blesses you personally. God blesses this church. There is both opportunity and responsibility. I know that sounds cliche, but it's true nevertheless. Opportunity and responsibility to help usher in the reign of God on earth. To be like the ideal Davidic king. To be like King Jesus. And, and perhaps realizing never perfectly, but more than we have to fulfill that vision of Psalm 72, that vision enacted in the life of the Lord to help the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. You too, you too can take pity on the weak. You too can seek justice for the oppressed. You too can live and preach and mirror the gospel in every interaction in your life. So, even in Judsonia or Circe or Rosebud, may we seek the heart and mission of God. 
may our hearts break over what breaks the heart of God. And may our heads that know and our hearts that feel be joined with hands that actually serve those whom God has placed in our sphere of influence. I want to commend uh, the Highway Church. I know you're not any more perfect than Rosebud is. But in the year that we were here, and what I hear from Devin and some of the elders who are colleagues at Arding, I know you guys have good hearts. And I know you are seeking to be a shining light in Judsonia and Arkansas and way beyond. I hope Rosebud is as well. And I'm sure the highway leadership would say it takes all of you. It takes all of you doing your part with your gifts, with your energy, with your talents, with your abilities to be a part of a mission that can actually change people's lives and thus change the world in which we live. My prayer is that God would bless you in everything you do good for the glory of God. Could we pray God's blessings as we close? Our gracious Father, I'm thankful for this evening. I'm thankful for the good friends that um, are a part of the Highway Church. I'm grateful for uh, the feeling at home I always have when I come to be able to speak honestly and frankly, but hopefully lovingly and kindly, knowing <laughs> I speak to myself first. I pray that you would bless this good church. I pray that you would bless the elders and the deacons and the ministry leaders. I pray that you would bless every, every servant in this church. I pray that you would bless the preaching and the teaching, but also the serving that I know is going on in this community, is even going on in these two weeks. And I pray that you will be glorified through them. And I pray that people be one to the life of the Lord as a result. And I pray that your righteousness and your justice will be enacted, not just by the King of Israel, but by every member of the Highway Church. That everyone would find ways and opportunity to be your head and your heart and your hands. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm done. I don't know if there's any...